welcome back to Hail As Row. You're here with your hosts, um, the gentleman. And I'm Papa Smoke, and we're back with a big one here, I like, I would say. Oh, yes. It's, uh, well, it's been a little while since the last one. Um, anyone that is listening for the first time, uh, we uh, sit and watch films in lockdown because we've got nothing better to do. Yeah. And uh, we review these films. Um, at the minute, we're looking at Total Films' top 100 most influential films of all time. Yeah, we're, we're coming to the end, aren't we? This is the last show of this. This is, uh, well, one more after this. Is it one more? Oh, well, yes, yes, it is one, one more. Because I've got to pick. Then yeah, yeah, I'm going to pick. Um, you've got to give me the three, which I'm really excited about. But, um, yeah, so we're looking at that at the moment, and we fell upon Mean Streets, Martin Scorsese's... Uh, not his debut, but uh, definitely his debut well, into his an award-winning... It's his debut feature film, isn't it? Well, it's it's his debut kind of award-winning. Is it? Yeah. He's, he did. He made up films for quite a long time beforehand, even like short films and stuff like that. Um, I thought it was his uh, first like feature film release. No, I don't believe so, but nah. it's his first one of note, most definitely. Yeah, so well, um, well, we kind of made the decision that because we're both... <laughs> absolutely love Martin Scorsese and within this lockdown with like yeah what we're going to do so we thought we'd watch a very wide variety of Martin Scorsese and yeah. I mean this has been the I, longest I did not longest regret any of it I've not no, regret no not a single point um, I you know I, I've always said that Martin Scorsese is one of my favourite directors and I know for a fact he's one of your favourite directors yeah, of all right, time he, he is my um, favourite director and so we decided that we we're going to watch a bunch of films and to be honest this is the most research to date that we've done on one uh, one episode so this is quite exciting um so we watched of course we watched mean streets first then we watched um C- rage and bull rage and bull yeah and then casino and then finally to top it off oh, the cream the cream on the end of the, the creme de la the creme, creme the uh, creme de la creme yeah gangs of new york gangs of new york fantastic I mean, what a film that yeah. is 100 percent like that's like top three for me. Is yeah, up there. I mean that's the thing. Uh, Martin Scorsese is a household name. Um, he's one of the big greats. He's part of the new director era, uh, new Hollywood era that emerged along the sides of George Lucas and Martin Spielberg. And we both said in the, the previous podcast that you know he's leagues ahead of a lot of other people and he's stayed relevant. Well, that's what for I mean. When you, look, when you look at his career, I mean, he's just been nailing it yeah time after time again and when you look, look at the repertoire of films in mm-hmm. the like list of actors he's worked with i know he's very uh tight knit with the actors he does work with. he seems that he, that he likes obviously rob de niro joe pesci i can i just say from watching like, these films again because some of these i haven't seen some i have but not for a very long time and i've got to admit i have this new adult found love for Joe Pesci. I loved him as a kid, yeah. but now as a, as an adult, as a element of him, I love even more now. Even in like the Irishman, he's still he's still. He's the best part. thing of the Irishman, in my opinion, to be honest. And Joe Pesci is a fantastic actor. He's probably my one of my favorites out of the ensemble um, of Scorsese ones. But this has been great because we've watched, we've looked at four films that span pretty much forty years in difference. Yeah, nearly forty years in difference of his career across all the boards. So it's been really cool. I mean, I, so what was your first like? When did you first learn about Scorsese? What was the first film you watched, if you remember that? I like, see, I've watched... I've, the first one I watched, I've watched so many when you look at all... Well, I've watched all these big movies. Yeah. Like, all, like Departed, uh, Goodfellas, um, List End, this, like Gangs of New York, all the ones we've watched here I've already mm-hmm. seen before. Yeah. And it's just so good, man. And my first ever, if I remember, because I, I was thinking of this myself, how long it was mm-hmm. when I'd seen her. My first Martin Scorsese film, and it was Goodfellas when I was about 13, 14. Obviously, not the film yeah. you should be watching at that time, but <laughs> you sneak in, didn't you? When he... <laughs> yeah, well, no, I think it probably was my dad that put it on, to be honest, not probably knowing what just like asked it in front well, of him. That's the thing, he's spanned over ah, generations, so there's, what I mean. there's grandparents like his, that adore yeah, him. That's what I mean. Yeah. My dad's a big, like, love of his film, so. That's probably how I got into it. Yeah, absolutely. Me first foot in the door, and that's a I mean, good film as well. I yeah. love that film. I mean, the first, there's definitely a film that my dad would have played that I would have kind of half watched as a young kid. Yeah. Um, well, then you just uh, appreciate the all that you get. Yeah, which is exactly. Nice. Um, but the first film that I really began to pay attention to was Taxi Driver. Um, Taxi Driver, yes. You know, it's just, it's been iconic for a bunch of reasons. So as soon as I went to university, that was one of the references I loved so much in regards to. 
the development of a character. But um, I guess we should probably go like in order of film well, to watch. So we're, we're we're primarily see... rating Mean Streets, but yeah. Well, battle plan was to because it's kind of we're just going to treat it as like a Martin Scorsese special. I won't. We just yeah. go, go see how long we can talk to him about because we're both very passionate about these films and very passionate about him as a man. Yeah, exactly. So I thought, yeah, let's just go for it, and we're going to review as you Mean Streets in the order that we watched it. We're going to go Mean Streets. Then we're gonna go Raging Bull, then we're gonna Casino, then we're gonna finish with what I think is the prime finisher in Gangs of New York. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, let's start with Mean Streets first. So that to me, I think is like the earliest Monsters Scorsese feature film that I've watched. Um, I don't think I've seen any work earlier than that. But how what, how did That's you find it. it? Well, I just stumbled upon it by accident, really, not knowing what it was, mm-hmm. and then I started watching it and then realizing what it was. It hooked us instantly though. Like yeah. it, it's got his style from the off, and it's yeah. There's some issues with it because of the time and like a few little weird things on it, and like mm-hmm. because obviously it was his first feature, like his big feature film. Yeah, it was um like not the budget he would have had and all these others because obviously he was getting recognised in that way. Yeah, no one's gonna put that so, much money to him straight. Yeah, off. no one's just gonna give him unlimited mm-hmm. funds, not knowing his potential. So yeah. it was like a proven stomping ground kind of... 100%. Should I mean, this, this is the, the film that put him on the map. I mean, hence why Mean Streets and is it, in the list. Yeah. And so there's some things that do lack because of that, but stories mint. Mm-hmm. The characters, obviously, he's got that as in a young Harvey Cartel. Keitel, is it? Yeah, okay? Keitel, I Keitel, think so. Like yeah. it is, is how we pronounce his second name. And uh, Robert De Niro. Can I just say that out of all of Robert De Niro's performances and most films I've seen, that... I feel it's one of my favourite. You can Robert see why he got cast again, definitely. And you can see why, yeah. obviously, Scorsese seen it to me, because I think that was one of his first roles, wasn't it? Like, it was, yeah, and like he wasn't a main character either. He was a side character. And he it, was, and it's obviously that, the, whatever happened on that first shoot, the relationship yeah. they build in the repertoire, that in what he showed to, obviously, Scorsese, he, he'd seen something in him, and he's yeah. used him in literally 90% of his films to be honest I mean, it, it, it's the peanut butter the jelly in it really Aye. and then uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's the bread I don't think yeah. that makes the um, like the ultimate Scorsese package really um, but Mean Streets was I haven't seen it before it was really nice to watch a film that comes from a director's roots and kind of the neighbourhood there's so well, much yeah, about that what, film you can tell well, is about him um, not so much the crime element of it but the the world that he build, built there is very much from his own memory and what yeah, he well, that's that's what it basically is. Like the whole story of it is mm-hmm. um like these like it's still like mafia like influence. It's still like yeah. it's a mafia crime, but these are like not technically mafia, they are, but they've got like they're not really mafia. They're, they're not like in the, the like street level they? they're the very like hoodlum street level folks. Yeah, they like, are yeah. thugs like that mm-hmm. of like from like they're still in that. They're like, just crime. kids, really, aren't they? Uh, they're, like, they're kids. I uh, kids causing crime, trying to make money, and like yeah. in that life, and probably I can see his influence of making it that he could have went one way. You know what I mean? Martin, there's no reason Martin Scorsese couldn't have ended up living that life. Yeah, but he went because he was around that, and it was what was like happening all around him and it's what yeah. a lot of men of his age at the time would have been brought up to do it's a lot about the community that's yeah, built that's around him that is very it's similar to his life it's easy to fall into that kind yeah. of but because he obviously knows a lot of people in that like he would have known people from his neighbourhood that would have went on that to do that could have went on yeah, yeah 100% without a doubt and it's uh, nice to see that he put a lot of effort into it because that he knew how it worked in that way it was a very inspirational film to watch I think from the aspect of a director was to see you know what is regarded as a director's debut um and see like how much of himself is in there and it's held catapult him i mean for anyone that doesn't realize why the films in the top 100 film most influential films of all time is because of the use of music in it and it was kind of before then there was always very traditional scores for films and they were still in the early stages of experiment with what could be a soundtrack to a film um there was always yeah. kind of the big main ideas of what it was but with this one Martin Scorsese uh, basically collected cassettes of music from his entire childhood that he's just kept over time. And so uh, not just this film, but a lot in his films, you'll see um, a, a selection of a song maybe used more than once or well, songs yeah, from, particularly from the same era. And it's just, it's his kind of, apparently when he's writing, when he's working with the writer for the scripts, he'll ask to, for them to make a note to write a song on the note side of the script. Um, a particular song so he's already had the song in his mind from the very beginning I well like quite you see you do, you do see that in this film because like the mm-hmm. first song that gets played is a song that like repeats in about three or four of his later works like 
I can't even remember the name of the song, but I know exactly how it goes, and it's in like Goodfellas. Yeah. It's in uh, like about three or four different films. It's in hundred percent. Yeah. And it's like you're saying it's music from his childhood, and it's what he grew up with, and it was used firstly in this film in a way like you're saying never before, mm-hmm. and it's like catapulted like basically having a soundtrack for a film because a lot yeah. of films now will literally release like a decent soundtrack because of that film mm-hmm. and it's like very closely linked and I'm guessing this was one of the first films that people would have took note and went wow the music in that was amazing yeah like, I want to buy it somewhere and they would have probably I'm guessing there's a, a Mean Street CD soundtrack yeah. somewhere <laughs> it probably is 100% it's probably catapulted that whole like yeah this film was really good to kind of see the beginnings of Martin Scorsese's uh, kind of style and technique um, and particularly noted with this one was the production design of, of the film because of course most of Martin Scorsese films you know his production design like you know the aesthetic of the world is very kind of true to the era or to the narrative um, so they are quite realistic but he does like to play a lot with colours so it tends to be that antagonists um, will at the beginning of the story have very kind of normal clothes that blend in and the richer they get the more flamboyant pink stuff they wear but one colour in particular that Martin Scorsese likes to play with is the colour red well, and this that. film was used a lot of the colour red within the bar it was yeah I was about to say I noticed that in a lot of the um, bar scenes it was very like all, it, it was always a sign by of a red it was like yeah. A, yeah well that's like a hostile environment really like a Basically, like kettle bubbling over, isn't it? Ah, oh, it is. Like, yeah. That's why all them scenes were, they were literally on the verge of like somebody erupting into a massive, yeah, like kick off or a fight or something like that. Because, well, it does happen a few times in the film. Mm-hmm. It's all centered around the bar, the drama. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, hundred um, percent. I mean, yeah, the cast were fantastic. It was, you know, it was a really enjoyable film. Um, and it was just really inspiring to watch for the first time. Um, but I guess next one, Rage and Bull. Now, you've seen this before. You, this is quite a big film for you, isn't it, Rage and Bull? Well, I'm obviously like boxing fan, so it picks a couple of boxes. It's a Scorsese film. It's yeah. It's Robert Neeran, who I also adores in that. Yeah. And it's about one of my favourite boxers, going to the like, biopic of uh, Jake LaMotta. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it's in the... 1920s or something like that. It's very early on, yeah. It's very I mean, early on. It starts from there, like spans away his whole career. Mm-hmm. In the, like the late 50s, I feel. Now, and I'm, that's a whole... Yeah. Like 30 years, it goes over his whole life. Mm-hmm. From his like early days, like trying to struggles to get a, like a title shot to in his later life when he retired and I'm like owned a club and... Yeah. Goes through like quite a good span of his life and it's... Um, I mean, it's really good. It's really true to the event it's very gritty yeah it's, not, it is, yeah. it's a very his story's not a pretty one he's not had a glamorous life and it, it feels very honest to it does yeah, yeah. I, I feel that's good towards like Jake Lamotta himself yeah. you've got to give a bit of credit on because he was like overseeing a lot of it and I mm-hmm. guess he was brutally honest with himself because he's done a lot of bad he's not a good he's not a nice guy like yeah the, no that's true it's dick. It is quite admirable, and to be honest, it makes for a better story. I think. But I love, I love the way it was done. It was done perfectly. I will right. So, I will, so the films I haven't basically the first three films I haven't seen, but the last film I have, which is Gangs of New York. Yeah. Um. But so out of the three that I hadn't seen before and I'd watched, um, I honestly was really, really happy with. I I think the Rage and Bull was like my favorite surprise out of the three. Yeah. Within the first opening, just the way it's framed, like the way it's framed, where he's in between the boxing ropes, yeah, and he's just dancing about, and uh, you know, you point out before the whole bit when it, one of the matches he's coming in and it just follows him from oh the yeah, literally the into the ring from like from him being quiet, to, like him in his own dressing room, yeah, to the like craziness of the arena he's fighting. It's all in one shot, just him like walking towards the camera, yeah. And then it like gets to a certain point as he enters the ring and he steps out the way and it follows up and it's literally just like. If it's not one shot, it's edited so beautifully that it is looks like one shot. I'm honestly surprised to not see Rage and Bull in the 100 most influential films of all time because every single boxing film I've ever seen, to be honest, or even just kind of you know MMA film that kind of thing, you can always see like an, an influence, influence of it. from you this can. film. Yeah, absolutely, 100 percent can. You can see a lot of it, like in the way the shots, that kind of shots, like the walking yeah. down the tunnel to the hitting into the arena. The, even the shots from like them in the ring 
you know what I mean? Edit like the fight so sequence. perfectly. I mean, this is one of the things that for me, for me made me re- fall in love with Scorsese to a whole new level, and it was the scene of the sound designer and the editing, um, the editor that he has on board, and he has these guys on board and most of his films as well, and they do deserve credit. They're fantastic. And it's, you know, looking at the way the fight scenes are uh, done, you know, the fact they're using the fast, quick paces of editing, yeah. but also being able to slap bang in like a brief moment, a slice somewhere in the film that comes relevant to the emotion of the story. And the whole fight sequence, it, he just knew how to build tension. He did. And it's all with sound as well. So, of course, it, it cuts quite a lot. There's um, one of the main fights that he has in the ring. It cuts quite a lot with the, the bulbs of the cameras, everyone taking photos. And Aye. the cut will come with the sound Aye. of the... Of the bulb and even the kind of build up of that final punch in the face, you know, when he fall when he's on the ropes and he's falling down, the build up to that where like everything becomes quiet, everything becomes quiet. It's been so loud, like violent, yeah, so then, loud. Sh- everything comes quiet. The camera the slow, camera. the camera slows down, Aye. and there's this really interesting uh, pull focus on it as well. So almost perspective changes, yeah. and then of course that big punch and there's like a bang, and it just. Bang. yeah it just uh, builds up so well it's like dropping the hammer literally in like dropping it in suspense it's yeah. such a good way he does it and like I say it just it looks good I like the whole that's black and white mm-hmm. and my whole motto was that, that was because it keeps on cutting back like every now and then through the film it yeah. keeps on cutting back to a uh, a little screen of like what the fight would have looked like then in the day like in the 40s how they would have watched it on a TV mm-hmm. And it, I feel like every time he's in, like that world is a fight. Yeah, his whole world is a fight. Basically, all he does is fight, and he's fights everyone. He fights his family. He fights mm-hmm. his wife. He's always fighting. He always fights himself. To yeah, the he point. does. Yeah, and it's the his life is black and white because it's like a fight uh-huh. that would have been watched back then, and that's why I, I like that. Yeah. That was my take on it. I don't know if that's true, but that's how I seen it, and I liked it. Hundred uh, percent. You know, I've from. Uh, I've met quite a few people in, in that world of uh, you know uh, fight and sport, um, but there does seem to be this element that there needs to be a certain kind of mindset to have that can be quite conflicting. Yeah, like yeah. it made the what made him great was the fact he was a, he just was an, an angry, angry man, <laughs> horribly angry, paranoid, just a fighting, yeah. just like a. It was almost like, like he a was dog, at his like a fighting dog, yeah. basically like a pit dog of a man. He was I. Some of those stuff when he's like feeling jealous of Aye. the men. Uh, there's one of the boxers that talks to his wife, or she says that he. But looks, she literally just has a passing comment of like, like he's a pretty guy. And yeah, he was a pretty up and coming fighter, and that, and he like takes he absolutely destroyed him. Yeah, because like, kind of, of took that kind of extra step to well, kind of make him a bit more. immoral. He was very abusive man to his yeah. Like, not a nice guy at all. No, hundred percent. An interesting life story. Yes, most definitely it is, and it kind of it does span over a lot of his lifetime which is quite a key factor I think well yeah it's good that it shows that and I like uh, I've got to say I can see why Rob De Niro won his Oscar as well 100% he, bought mean, it, he plays that he's yeah. like best acting even though if it's not your, I feel it's not my favourite role of him but you've got to say it's his best it's his best role like he plays uh, that is, yeah. he's, he plays the acting in there is like to a per, like superb some of the mm-hmm. scenes are like he really 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 got into it he yeah. really really did the, like that bit of the story, like great, like the character itself. It's been, I've got to say, it's been so nice with going through all these films as well, going through Robert De Niro's early career again and just really admiring how much he's achieved he, as an he's actor. Very, yeah, he's achieved a lot. He, you can't argue he's very typecast, and I can see why people would say that. But Which was interesting when he did like Meet the Fockers because I, it was like using his typecast to his advantage. It is, he, well, that's what he yeah. does. He's very good at playing that. Mm-hmm. But even so, he does typecasting. Like the acting is superb. There's like little moments of just like that bit I love in this film is when he's in the cell. Yeah. And he gets locked up and he just breaks down like how he's like hitting the wall and he's going, No, why, 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 why? Yeah. And he's just like he's basically fighting himself. And it's like that's what he is. He's just such a self destructive person. Mm-hmm. And even though he is just playing his typical like Italian American kind of slightly mobbish, fuggish yeah. attitude that he plays in a lot of films. But this he is still has like emotion, superb, like it? sub stories like that where yeah. like the emotion felt so real and you've got to give him that he's a great actor for that like he's yeah. not sloppy he's very mm-hmm. he plays it really well yes he might only play a few things and he's got a 
small Arsenal, but man, it delivers yeah. every time. It delivers. Which brings me to the next film that we watched. Casino. This Casino. is like Casino. Now, going from what you were saying there, and I don't, I love all these films, but if I had to list an order out of these films, I feel Casino would go down the bottom. And if any criticism I could give it is that when talking about his performance in Rage and Bull, well, he, doesn't, this, he does seem very kind of tight cast in Casino he, to a degree. He's like, he's like, even in this, he's just his character is not that interesting. Yeah, it's he's very like he's a he's kind of interesting because he's a I like the whole how meticulously analytic he is mm-hmm. and he's like all about the numbers and all about the outcomes yeah. of running this casino basically it's like Joe Pesci and um, Robert De Niro get like tasked with running the casino in Vegas when Vegas was first like well when it was built but like when it was all mob ran yeah because casino like Las Vegas was basically built on the mafia mm-hmm. like and this is the whole like he's running the casino him being the heavy handed Joe Pesci his style of just <laughs> being the enforcer Aye. and then Robert De Niro being like the brains, like the logistics and the, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, or like I say, he's very like meticulous in numbers and how it's run and the money that's made and yeah, his whole backstory is like such a good better because of that because mm-hmm. he studies all the stats and he's like he never loses a bet yeah and that's how he got the job and he's like he kind of plays that role he's very like uptight, walking about and it's not how you ever see Robert De Niro really he's always like the, he's quite a loud outspoken and quite a loose person I him, and yeah. this is a very tight upright role he plays yeah that and is it, true it's it's very stuck to that there's not much deviation from that like there's no arc on his character he is kind of that throughout yeah so I can see why he's saying he's probably out of all, he's, it's not my favourite role though. he's very low role of what yeah. he plays I mean don't get us wrong it's, it's a really good film and again and he's just constantly improving his style of his style of editing I feel yeah it's um, very similar to, you know, I feel like if you like Goodfellas you might like this film a bit better it's basically the same but like in a different mm-hmm. setting well yeah of course I mean and that's that's what I feel though like we I, are typecast that yeah very, mafia. very much and I feel like Goodfellas takes the cake for that for just that kind of yeah extra sorry level. what we saying anyways about um, but I think uh, with Casino as well it's it, it made us realise that uh, Martin Scott and this works really well for most of his films I mean it works really well for all the films we're talking about is that he very focuses on characters um, on difficult complex difficult characters like characters that aren't necessarily good like they're quite bad characters <laughs> yeah. in very hostile worlds if that makes sense they're bad because of the surrounding the ring where you feel like they've, it, there's some morals about them that you kind of identify with um a lot of these films do do that really, and I think that's what it makes such interesting character really and worlds all together. It does, yeah. Yeah, it makes really interesting characters and worlds, and that's what he's really good. He's really good at building a universe, like a world for you to see. And for well, myself, he, I've never been big on betting. Um, yeah. I'm not a big better, so he makes you feel that like lifestyle yeah. easy. Like he mm-hmm. he depths it into a lifestyle. Like he, like why would be like mafia or like let's say that's still mafia but like the casino the rush yeah. of like the gambling and Raging Bull you really felt like in his life of what he would be like the boxer mm-hmm. and he does that well with a lot of his films and it's Absolutely. his whole like it's his whole I feel like that's what he does the best you know he gets you in that little story that yeah. he creates he, but even though he does he likes to stick to like true events so a lot of them are based off like loosely true events yeah. Or like true people are based there's people in it that are based off people who were actually alive. Yeah. It's just a dramatized story, really, that mm-hmm. he makes up. He uses the events but then creates a little story in that world of events. I feel like telling uh telling stories are based on true events is such an interesting thing because yeah. I, I do strongly believe you you should tell a story, um, like tell a true story. I feel like true stories are just I'm always a firm believer that you kind of make films and tell stories for you know, change in some way, whether it be someone just kind of feeling a different change or thinking a different change. Yeah. Um, and with true stories, uh, it, that's such a good reason to do those kind of films, really, because if something like that, you know, something important happens in a true story, it's a bit of an echo that across really just resonates with an audience a lot easier. The connection between screen and person is just a lot sm- Like, the, the reach to that is a lot shorter. Yeah, it's very, yeah. like, easy to feel because you know that there is truth to it. Yeah, you connect, reconnect a lot more because you're like, well, it actually did happen, mm-hmm. you know. Even yeah. like to the point like 
it even says like obviously you don't look at these films and it's like that happened to a T. Yeah. The very like thingy, but you know he he makes the world believable of where they'd happened. Like you go, yeah, well that could have easily happened in that world. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's what I like about these these films. Yeah. I it mean really I really dives you into it. I don't disagree as well that, you know, because a lot of his films are very dramatised from true events, so they are based on it and inspired by it in some way, some more than others. Yeah. Um, but I don't necessarily see it as, as a bad thing. Like, I do agree with it, but it's also knowing what stories you should just tell the solid. Yeah. And it's all about it kind knows of what, what stories what, to tell you. You know, what, you, picks... what story you really wanted to tell. You know, are you wanting to tell this person's story or are you wanting to tell a story for a for a, a very a very significant change yeah. in the audience, I think, is yeah. why you would dramatise it, to be honest. I think that's probably why. Well, he just makes a story. Like, the stories he picks, it's not like them not dramatic enough. Yeah. It's just... Absolutely, I mean... He embellishes them well, that's what you've got to do. It's a great storyteller that does that. It would be crap if you, every story you heard wasn't embellished a little bit. Like, yeah. people who do that of tales of, like, of the dragons and knights. Dragons like, and knights, yeah. that's all it is. Embellished stories. It would have started with one tale of something and it got embellished a million <laughs> years. Probably was, something was, I was, fucking was a... <laughs> punched a rabbit and then 300 years down the line he killed an ogre with a stone. <laughs> threw it 100 yards and hit him in the eye. Aye, was that one? There's, there's Phil the knight that one day was strolling around and a lizard jumped on his horse. He got such a fright, he killed the lizard, went home and told everyone else, but no one knew what a lizard was, so it just turned into, over time, a dragon. Aye, <laughs> okay. I killed a 60 foot dragon, laddie. Skinned it leaf. <laughs> but looking at, you know, true stories that have been dramatised quite extensively, is Gangs of New York. Um, and it is very ah, oh, but mate, yeah, it's such a story that I just let it be. Of course, absolutely, I, and this is the film it's, that I agree with. It's, that. Like, it's such a good film. Yeah, oh, I mean, mate, I was still too. surprised by how much of it is actually true. Like the I, character was well, a real. Phil that, the Butcher was a real person. Mate, that was he. I, I was looking into that, and I didn't even know what he's. Bill the Butcher, any film, any TV series. He's my favourite fictional character out of anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any book, anything. I like him. And now you know it's a real person. And it must have blown was, your mind. I knew, now I know it was based on, like, loosely on a real person. And that's, that's really cool, isn't it? That, I, mean, I mean, he's I, a terrible I mean, I human being. I don't think I would yeah. like to have met him at all. <laughs> but I love... The his, psyche of this person. I mean, I love his story. His whole... Oh, I love the whole story of this film, to be honest. Yeah. Now, the only bit really predominant bit that isn't really based on like fact is uh is Leonardo DiCaprio and his father yeah. like there was tr these gangs of people in well, this I era that were conflicting in the same groups there the dead rabbits well the thing about exist, this but film, they didn't exist as much I was saying is it's basically it's based around true events it's based about like early civilization well the whole story is like early civilization of America really it's and, very like, early America yeah, very it, early yeah. America and it's um them like New York City based in like the heart of New York City yeah five points and it's like them being from a shanty town basically these tribes and like war chiefs really that's what it was like Aye. literally like African villages do it now but this was like what New York back in the day it's literally just tribes of like people mm -hmm. like well not people like they're still like not tribes but like they're still sophisticated it's, it's, it's people a tribe but they're, like, they're literally mentality. like a gang Aye, it's like mm -hmm. a tribe mentality with yeah. like a war chief leader and they're all struggling for control over these five points where these so five stories of New like York meet. war that were going and on and the just yeah, like story war. in it and that really did happen in New York at the time like the Irish with the potato farms going on there's a lot mm -hmm. of true events based around it but this is just like a dramatic story yeah in between while all this is going on a story that didn't actually happen yeah but the people some of the people in it like Bill the Butcher in these dead rabbit gang yeah. they were actually the gangs that were there but there was never like uh, An eventual son. He, he actually died in the civil war so that's like a yeah. big, big thing but he, you're right really the story that's trying to tell and this is what I love so much is because like Martin Scorsese is so proud of his roots being from this kind of this culture of that like is associated gang with gangs that he goes so far back before in like the earliest ever gangs uh, yeah and it's just so oh, it's, but it's I love best. it so oh, much mate. Daniel Day Lewis man oh, what that. a performance is Bill the Butcher oh. Daniel Day-Lewis is 
arguably one of the best actors in the world. Well, this is shows this shows the level that that Martin Scorsese is at that he can come up with Daniel Day Lewis and get that kind of performance from. Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis picks when he wants to work, basically. Yeah, well, that's it, isn't it? Yeah, Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, everything he's been in since well before that point has been award winning. You know, yeah. he's been a very big spectacle. Yeah, um, and this is my favorite. Daniel Day Lewis performance, I Same, think. 100%. Absolutely, Bill the Butcher is just. There's an element of Shakespearean theatre. Well, that's it, what this whole so story good. is. Yeah. It literally is, and there's a point that gets referenced in the film. Yeah. And it, it literally is a Shakespearean story. It's a story. The whole story, basically, I'll tell it in a Shakespearean kind of way. Yeah. It's that a father has a young son, and this father has an enemy. He comes to a like foreign land mm-hmm. and lands and there's an enemy that is the native that he's just trying to make a life for himself and he has yeah. to fight Bill the Butcher who is this native. Yeah. And obviously he dies in combat to him. Like this whole the whole, the whole ethos of like a warrior code between this young boy's father, which is mm-hmm. he gets called the priest in Bill the Butcher, that these two warriors have like a destined honored fight. Yeah. And the both honourable men, they both loved each other because of that in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Like they had a very like level of respect, even so far as when this young boy comes back, which is Leonardo DiCaprio after he goes to an orphanage yeah. for like fifteen years. He comes back, and Bill the Butcher is like, he kind of res- still like respecting his father. Yeah, and he obviously goes back to kill Bill the Butcher, Leonardo DiCaprio, and it's this whole thing that he obviously sees gets very close into his gang because he runs everything and it's just like he kind of sees his father in the man who murdered his father a, he and has an air of respect uh, for him as because well, he, he lives the same code and the same life that his father did yeah and then like he obviously becomes terms with it. it's like really hard for him to when he realises like, that Leonardo DiCaprio is his enemy do, right? it He's, really upsets him it does I right? really yeah. upsets both of them and the, he does try to kill him eventually mm-hmm. and obviously he doesn't succeed and there's this whole story of him rising up again to fight him, like Bill did to his father before. It's yeah. Like, it's a, such a... All the stories intertwine, like literally he becomes Bill the Butcher in a way, Leonardo DiCaprio, I, to I defeat feel Bill the Butcher. The best scene in the whole film is that turning point where the cat's kind of out of the bag and it's he's been living this... Uh, very blissful life Aye. with Bill the Butcher. Aye, he's actually became like one of his top lieutenants. Yeah, and he's having a really good... And it all kind of turns on his head and he gets caught out instantly. His plan fails. Yeah. He tries to kill Bill the Butcher. It doesn't work. And that whole scene when he's got when he's got him down on the table and he get, you know he gives him a scar and everything else and making a show of it, like, it's just... It's, it is something else. And I, I feel that what has been really nice about watching these films all together that span over Martin Scorsese's career has really helped me learn how to how to develop a story in some you know and what makes a good story and what to make, what makes really interesting characters as well it does make the character development just mint on that this like yeah. all the characters have a class development a class arc mm-hmm. so out of the four films we watch we, how would you put them in order going from like the first, fourth being like you know we we, we love them all to be honest yeah. I feel anyone who's listening and wants to watch these films watch them like, and you will love them um, but in order would you say I mean I would probably go. I put Mean Street at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Because like I can see it's his early works. I still love the film. Mm-hmm. It's a good film and it's a great starting film. And I'm really surprised how well he did. Yeah. Like I was like I wasn't expecting great things when I first watched it because I was like it's first film. I'm just going to take it as is. He's such yeah. a great man. Anyways, mm-hmm. I'll forgive one bad film. <laughs> yeah. It still wasn't. <laughs> still wasn't a bad film. But I'd put that at the bottom, then I'd have to switch it up in the order that I watched them and say that I'd put Casino next. Yeah. I do like Casino because I like Goodfellas as one of my favourites, but like mm. you say, I think that is the better depiction of that truly yeah, like, stereotype mob film mm-hmm. than Casino. Like Goodfellas does it a lot better. So yes, I'd put Casino, then I'd say Raging Bull. I love Raging Bull. Mm-hmm. But, I, Raging Bull was a favourite of mine. I that is say. one of my favourite Scorsese's, but... Yeah. The reason I'm putting Gangs of New York at the top is because that's just one of my favourite films. Yeah, absolutely. Ever. Absolutely. Never mind Scorsese. I think, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the same order I would put them in. It's, you know, I've enjoyed this so much and I've enjoyed this process so much, to be honest, of actually watching these films with you. I feel like I've learned a lot from watching all these films. Do you feel like that? 
Have you learned a lot from like, all these four different films we've watched since the very first episode? Well, I could, it's nice because we've kind of watched them, did like, and it's you've seen progression in his film work. Yeah, and you can see that he's just got better and better. Like, uh, he's honed his craft. He he nailed it from the off. Yeah, I feel he's got it, and he must have. He got probably such a wide response from that from getting it. Yeah, that he's just went right. We just stick. We've got the formula. Mm-hmm. You just gotta perfect it. Like all good things in life that have really succeeded, you think Coca Cola, st- stupid like stuff like that, like foods have all had a recipe and they've nailed it. And yeah, they've just homed it and just it once you've got the product, why change? Just get better and better. And that's what I feel he's done, and that's why yeah. he stayed so relevant because he's just had the p- blueprints perfect, mm-hmm. and he's just homed it. And it's just that's how he's yeah, that's where he is. That's Absolutely. what he is. He's just consistent product. Yeah. Uh, he is like Coca Cola of directing. He is, yeah. He is the Coca Cola of directing. No, he's literally just there. a consistent product, and he just nails it. Yeah, absolutely. Now we are on the last part of this now, and this is next episode is going to be the last episode of the series. How do you feel about that? I'm kind of upset in the way that. I'm been enjoying this and it's been bright like brown in me horizons of films. Yeah. But I'm feeling we're in a rut a bit with it, so I'm kinda happy for the refresh. Yeah, I I'm think I'm literally so. happy to just get a fresh vibe and just do yeah. something else. I think it's time that we announce what our uh, next series will be actually. I'm quite interested in this. We're gonna start following uh Oscar um every film that's won an Oscar since two thousand and one to two thousand uh, two thousand and twenty. So twenty years of the Oscars we're gonna we're gonna go through. Um, and we're gonna watch what won best picture each year, and of course we're gonna we're gonna maybe watch some of the nominees and yeah, we've already gonna... seen a lot of the nominees to be, talk about and decide whether or not these films actually deserve to win best picture because that's been definitely in the last five years I've noticed there's been a big debate within the Oscars is that the best film always gets picked wrong and someone else should yeah. get it. There's always a lot of argument about and it. Can, so. It's good because we can talk about as who maybe when talk about other categories like yeah like exactly yeah. and best mm-hmm. cinematography and. Maybe some films have obviously won multiple awards and maybe we could say that they could have deserved this, but maybe this should have went to that. Yeah, exactly. I feel like we're going to have a lot more content because there's some of these, we're all just kind of watching films and some of the films are hard to get a lot of content for, but I feel like if we're doing like the genre of the Oscar, yeah, we've got so much we can just give you assistance-wise. I'm, I'm really excited to do it, but I guess with that, let's find out what your three films you picked Right for the final episode of season one of High Lazarado. I went. I've tried to really think and just give a good option. I know. Was it what was the pressure like to actually be the one who to to decide? I mean, the last three films. I mean, it's kind of scary. It's more for you. To, You're gonna yeah, have to I've pick, got the, last to pick one. the last film. And it's a it's a bit of a. I feel like I've got went far apart from each film. Yeah. So what we'll watch it's going to be a very different podcast. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So first up, I went. The Blair Witch Project. Wow, okay. No, I was not expecting that one. Because I feel there's been so many films that have been influenced. It was the first ever kind of like camcorder style film. Oh, okay. yeah, and then I, everyone I in that left, right, centre yeah. started making camcorder horrors. It's like the, it, it's most accessible filmmaking I, genre as well. It's... Because you can, you can kind of substitute quality. Because <laughs> on the on, yeah, on the on the um There's basis a... that you're saying, oh well, it's meant to look grainy and yeah, you know it, what I it mean. It gives you the ample opportunity to take a mobile phone and shoot something on a mobile phone. Really, yeah, it's, it's very easy. Probably, yeah. it's definitely. I think if you're a, a starting filmmaker and you want to make films that aren't really going to cost money, um, or you know have you know the bit the the big essentials. I think this kind of genre of film would be quite interesting. So you've got, yeah, and a lot of people accessible. were very, because it was so, like, done in that way and was the first, there's actually a lot of people that when this first came out thought it was real. That's yeah. why it was influential, because of that. Well, I, I want to divulge a little secret here. We, we, when we were 17, we even, being kids and, you know, loving film in you know different ways we we ended up trying to do with uh, with some friends oh, of ours didn't we god we no, tried to do, no, we tried to... you're not bringing this shit on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> people people start looking for it now <laughs> luckily it's nowhere to be seen it's locked away that, you know. camp lockdown yeah camp lockdown yeah is. we do and it, it, that's because it, that, that's what i love about yeah. that genre of film is because it's it, it's so accessible tell you way. what 
we get a thousand subscribers. <laughs> we'll release. We'll release it's not, even, it's not even our film. To, you know, it's. We, I mean, I'm sure we'd be. Able to, but being a part of it, we, we uh, all. You know, uh, myself and our friend um, Tom, we did. We did uh, film studies in college, but we're all friends, and being able to make films together, all together, was just. So it fun. was mate. The whole yeah. shoot of that film was meant because we just went and got absolutely turned in a caravan site <laughs> yeah, and made a it movie. Was, it was the day we made not a film. <laughs> But it was like the best experience I've ever had it making was, a film. I... It definitely that that to me that experience is what I've carried on <laughs> in my ethos to be that in some degree every you know every shoot needs to be fun. And ah, it does absolutely. It does. Um, but go right. ahead. So, anyways, option. that was just the first yeah. choice. <laughs> Blair Witch. That had a lot of nostalgic <laughs> memories. <laughs> it did, yeah, it did. I had no words at that time. <laughs> um, next film, the original Iron Man. So, like, number one, Iron Man. Okay, one. right, yeah. So, mm-hmm. that was kind of, like, the first of that big Marvel f- franchise film starting towards, like, this whole Thanos, Infinity Wars. Yeah, you know what? so when much you, money. When you think of it that way, it, it, it is influential, isn't it, really? Yeah, like, yeah literally, his every, character. Every, it, every other pr- production company wants to have a franchise that successful now yeah, as well. basically. Yeah. Robert Downey Jr. as like Iron Man that was the start of it and he was in like how many other films like everyone. I remember being a kid at the time and hearing about Iron Man um, when it came out and I, my exact words when I was a naive kid because I didn't care much for weirdly enough I didn't care much for comic books when I was a kid it's something that I've gotten to the older I've gotten but yeah. when I heard there was an Iron Man film coming out I was just like Iron Man what a terrible name that is yeah. <laughs> but it is it is quite a good film it's so and the last, I went really big. I went top of the list, Silence of the Lambs. Oh, I mean, so I mean, like when you put it like that, look, it, I I'm feel actually like, intrigued to know why it's number one on the list because there's a lot. Well, of that's films what I said. I, I, we couldn't not do it and not have done number one, kind of. So, so I'm not influencing. You've, you've made the choice. I'm not, that's I'm not exactly how I agree. I, I agree with you. It, it is. It, I had this to needs to be the there. film to finish it off. I want to know why. This is number one because I have seen this film and I love this film and I'm trying to figure out why it's so influential. Yes. More inf- not so much why it's influential, but why it's more more influential than some of the other films on the list. So some of the films that were reviewed, I could arguably say was more influential, but maybe we're now going to watch it with a fresh pair of eyes yeah. in that kind of realm to understand that. And I feel like we're going to, I'm really excited to see what we find from that really. It'd be quite interesting. That's what, what my thought. Yeah. Well, this has been an this has been an extra lovely, a little bit longer special. Yeah, you know, I've really what enjoyed we it. All. Do. It's been it, it's been nice to talk about our favorite director. You know, he's one of my favorites, and uh, he's, I know he's definitely your favorite director. So he is my favorite yeah, director. Absolutely. So, guys, please tune in to the next and final episode of season one of High Lazarado. Yes. Um, which will be us reviewing, uh, Silence of the Lambs. Silence of the Lambs. Um, so, guys. With that, this has been Hi Lazarado. You're with the gentleman. And I'm Pop Smoke. And goodbye, my pals. <laughs>